I'm going to ask if you would this morning to open your Bibles to Mark's account of the gospel. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. The title of this morning's message is Our Best Work. Not just any work or not just our good work, but our best work. So Mark chapter 14, verse 1. Mark records, After two days it was the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for treacherous ways to arrest and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, or there, there might be rioting among the people. While he was in Bethany at the house of Simon, who had a serious skin disease, and as he was reclining at the table, a woman with an alabaster jar of pure, expensive, fragrant oil of nard, she broke the jar and poured it on his head. But some were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this fragrant oil been wasted, they said. For this oil might have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they began to scold her. Then Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you and you can do for them whenever you want. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. I assure you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to hand him over to them. And when they heard this, they were glad and promised to give him silver. So he started looking for an opportunity to betray him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would speak to our hearts through the preaching of your word. Lord, I pray that you would guard my words and that you would use me today as your mouthpiece. Use me as your instrument, Lord. Lord, I pray the words that I speak are the words that you would have me to speak. Lord, I pray that we would give ourselves to you in wholehearted devotion, worship. That our ears would be given to you, our minds, our hearts would be given to you. And that we would listen to the word of God as it is preached. And that we, this morning, would realize this is your word. It's not man's word, it's your word. It's you speaking to us. And help us to hear your voice in it. I pray for those here this morning who are lost. I pray for their salvation. I pray for those of us who are saved. As we evaluate our work this past year, I pray that we would be honest. And did we truly give you our best work? Lord, show us what's best. Show us how you respond to what's best. And Lord, I pray that we would give you what's best. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. One of the things I, one of the first devotions I shared with the staff when I came here as pastor, we have our staff meetings every Wednesday at 1 o'clock. And I shared with them from Philippians chapter 1, where Paul commended the church at Philippi for doing what was excellent. He didn't commend them for doing what was good. He didn't commend them for doing certain things well. Paul commended them for doing what was excellent. In other words, for doing what's best. And one of the things I shared with the staff the first time I had an opportunity to, to, meet, to meet with them is that we, we need to make it our desire not to do what's good. But we need to make it our desire to do what's excellent. We need to make it our desire to do what's best. And then I asked the question, and you've heard this question asked before, would we rather do a lot of things good or a few things well? Do we want to do a lot of things that are good or do we want to do, or do, we want to do what's best? And if we're really honest, a lot of good things will keep us from doing what's best. Amen? 
Well, I don't know about you, but as your pastor, I want to lead us to do what's excellent. I want to lead us to do what's best. One of the things I would like for you to do right now, I mean, here we are, we're beginning 2013. And I want you to reflect back on your life. I, I know that it's this time of year when people are always making New Year's resolutions. And, and do that if you want. But what I would like for you to do is to look back on, on, on 2012. And I want you to ask yourself the question. As an individual, did you do what was best? Concerning your quiet times, did you do it good or did you do it excellent? Have you read through the Bible? Have you ever read through the Bible? Did you read through the Bible this past year? Are you reading through the Bible every year? Why not? Are you doing what's good or are you doing what's best? Now, you, you know it's my job to, 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 uh, to dig a little, right? I mean, y'all know that, okay? So I'm going to dig. When, when you look at your evangelism, did you do it at all? Did you do it well? Did you do it good? Or did you do it excellent? When you think about fathers, when you think about raising and your children and Teaching them the word of God. Fathers, let's talk, about your, let's talk about your family devotion. Let's talk about circling your children around the word of God in the living room. And teaching them the scripture. Proclaiming to them the gospel. Having a family altar time where you come together in your home and you worship Almighty God on a regular basis. Did you do it well? Did you do it good? Did you do it at all? Or, did you do it best? Now, those are some individual questions that we should ask ourselves. And I pray that this coming year in 2013 that you would be saying, that you would be willing to say, Lord, this year by your grace, because I can't do it. Right? Let's acknowledge that from the very beginning. You and, you, we cannot live the Christian life. Let me just set you free for a moment. We can't live the Christian life. We cannot do it. Only Christ through us can. It's as we abide in him that we bear much fruit. So I want to encourage you as you look back on your life in 2012 and you say, you know what, if I'm really honest, I didn't give the Lord my best. But in 2013, I want to give the Lord my best. Well, let me encourage you not to focus on all the things that you need to be doing because that could be overwhelming. Let me encourage you just to focus on loving Jesus. And fathers, if you will just focus on loving Christ, then you'll find yourself being the husband and the father that you need to be. Amen. Wives, if you'll just find yourself longing and falling in love with Jesus all over again, you'll find that Christ through you is helping you to accomplish the things that you want to do. College students and, and youth, you, think, you, you look at your life and you say, man, I blew it in this area, I blew it in this area, I blew it in this area. I did some things I shouldn't have, I, I shouldn't have done and I want to do better. I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this, and I need to do this. And you're going to leave here thinking that you have all these things that you need to do in order to be the type of Christian that you need to be. And when you start doing those things, you're going to find out that it doesn't go very well because you become frustrated and the next thing you do, you, bec you become overwhelmed and the reason for it is you're trying to do it in your own strength. So just hear a word from your pastor this morning. Just fall in love with Christ in 2013. Just focus on abiding in Christ, getting to know Christ, spending time in his word, and you will find that all these other things that you're wanting to do will begin to take care of themselves. And also let me encourage you what, by, by what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 when he said, Finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you might be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. You, I can't do it, you can't do it. We cannot do this in our own strength. If you are a Christian, you already have the power of God in you through the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. The power of God is there. It's available. 
The only responsibility that you have is to put yourself in a position daily to walk in the power of God. How do you do that? Simply be a good branch. Be a good branch. You know what a good branch does? A good branch abides in the vine. And who's the vine? The Lord Jesus Christ. Be a good branch in 2013. Abide in Jesus and you'll bear much fruit. I want to encourage you. Give the Lord your best. Our best work. And now we have to ask ourselves as a church, as we look back in this past year, did we give the Lord our best? Are we giving the Lord our best as a church? I've got a lot of things that the Lord has been speaking to me about, and I always have to discern when's the right time to share them, and, and uh, have, have I earned the respect of the, of the people yet? I, I know there's pastoral respect, but do I have personal respect? And, how, you know, are they willing to, how willing are they to follow at this point? If I throw too much at them, are they going to begin to uh, be like an old coon hunting mule that I had when I was growing up as a kid? When it got tired, it just stopped. Put all four feet in the ground like this. And you could spur and you could whip and you could do whatever you wanted to. And that mule wasn't going anywhere. And eventually, if you kicked hard enough, eventually, you know what that mule would do? It would take off through the woods. And it would find the closest tree that it could find to drag you off. And you know what? Christians can be a little mule-headed sometimes. You know that? We can be a little mule-headed. If we move too fast, we'll want to put all four feet in the ground. If I know that if I want to move too fast, well, you'll, you'll want to put all four feet in the ground. And I'll be tempted to spur and to whip. And then you'll want to do what? You'll want to run off through the woods and find the closest tree that you can find to drag me off, right? So I'm trying to be patient. Trying to be patient, trying to be led by the Spirit of God. But I want to I want to talk to you this morning, just in the beginning, before we actually look at this passage. We're going to look at this passage in detail. But let me let me share with you about a man who gave the Lord his best. This man was born in August of 1761 in Northampton, England. His grandfather was a master of the school there in the village, and so was his father. He grew up, he grew up poor, but in a religious family. Eventually, he became an apprentice to a shoe cobbler. And eventually, uh, he, began, he began to work on shoes himself. This young man was very intelligent, loved the Lord, learned the Latin language at a very young age. As he was in the cobbler shop one day, he noticed that his boss had a, a book sitting on the shelf, and it was, it was, in, it was, in, it was written in Greek. He was intrigued as he pulled the, the book off the shelf and he began to look at the, 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 uh, the structure of the Greek language. And he was fascinated by it. So he began to learn and he began to study and he taught himself Greek. He went on to learn several other languages. Little did he know at that time that God was preparing him for something great. The man I'm talking to you about this morning is, is known as the father of the modern day mission movement, William Carey. Let me just share with you about Carrie for a moment. Carrie went on to marry his wife, Dorothy. He began to pastor a church. And not only did, did Carrie pastor a church, but he also uh, started a school in order to teach theology and, and so forth. And so God was using Carrie in a tremendous way. So working as a cobbler, working as a pastor, starting a school, uh, learning the Greek language, preaching the word of God, a very passionate young man. But one of Carrie's greatest passions was for what we call, what he called then foreign missions. We would say international missions today, right? But foreign missions. William Carey had a passion in his heart to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. William Carey was always the type of young man who had a very adventurous spirit. One of the things that God used outside the word of God, one of the things that the Lord used to cause Carey to have such a passion for missions was this book right here. The Life and Diary of David Brainerd. It's a wonderful book. You ought to get it and read it. David Brainerd was a young man who came to faith in Christ in his early 20s. He grew up thinking that he was saved, but finally after hearing the true gospel, he was truly converted and he was saved. David Brainerd was a missionary to the, American, uh, uh, to, to the Indians in colonial America. 
in the mid-1700s. One thing you need to know about David Brainerd, and I always say TB because sometimes I can't pronounce the word tuberculosis. Somebody say that for me. Doc, tuberculosis, how you say it? I, you ever have those words that you just can't say? That's one of mine. But one thing about it, I'm not ashamed. I attempted it, right? So now that you know what I'm trying to say, I'm just going to say TB from here on out, okay? So he had TB. It's just one of those words I can't get out. Some people think I'm speaking in tongues when I do it, but I'm not. <laughs> but, but, he, he, but he had TB, and he was very sick, very sick. He would, somebody liked that. But. <laughs> but he would ride horseback. He would go from village to village, from tribe to tribe, preaching the gospel. Now, let me just tell you this. One of the things that Kerry was so fascinated about Brainerd was Brainerd was totally dedicated to the cause. When you read David Brainerd's diary, you see that he's a very melancholy person. But not only that, there were times that he would be riding his horse, it would be pouring down rain, and he would be coughing up blood. He's coughing up blood, and he would ride to the next village. He would get off his horse. He'd prop himself up beside a post and start preaching. No energy to stand up, sick, but continued to preach. David Brainerd ended up dying at an early age. He was 27 or 29. His ministry was very short, only a few years. But it has impacted so many because God used him. And even though it was short, God has used him in a tremendous way because of his faithfulness. David Brainerd gave the Lord his best. And William Carey was motivated by the life of David Brainerd. William Carey knew that God wanted him to go to India. Go to India and preach the gospel to the heathen. That's the word that they used back then, okay? The heathen. Don't be offended by that. That's just that's what they used. And he wanted to go, but you know what? William Carey's wife didn't want any part of it. Dorothy. She had no desire to go whatsoever. Carey began to plead with her, and he began to beg with her, and this went on. As a matter of fact, William Carey attempted to leave. He got on a ship and was ready to leave, leaving the harbor. Some things happened. He wasn't able to leave. He went back to his house, began to plead with Dorothy once again to come and to go. I mean, here she is with three children, and finally she gives in. And Dorothy and William Carey and their three children board a ship, and they travel to India, knowing that once they left Great Britain, they would never return. And they never did. Now, let me just share this with you. Forty plus years William Carey spent there in India. During that time, he preached to millions. He translated the Bible into 40 different languages. He established churches and schools and humanitarian groups. At his death in 1834, William Carey was one of the most honored citizens in all of India. As a matter of fact, one of the practices in India is what, the, they, would, what they would used to do is they would take their children and they would throw them into the river as a sacrifice to their gods. They don't do that anymore. You know why they don't do that anymore? Because William Carey. Spent many years of his life battling that and eventually God used him to win that battle. Another thing that the Hindus would often do there in India is when a, when a man would die, you know what they would do to their widows? They would burn their widows along with their, the body of their husband. You know, they don't do that anymore. You know why? William Carey. So here we have a man who spent over 40-something years in India, translated the Bible into over 40 different languages. Millions have been saved. People still today in India are being impacted by the, by the passion and the faithfulness of William Carey still to this day. As a matter of fact, I have the, I have the Hindi Bible here. This is the Bible that, that is used by those in India who speak the Hindi tongue. This Bible was translated by William Carey. And not only do I have the Hindi Bible, but I also have the Bengali Bible. Again, translated by William Carey. This Bible and many others, this is the Bibles that they use there in India, still to this day. Because of the faithfulness of William Carey. William Carey gave the Lord his best work. And the reason I, I introduced this message this way, because that is what we see here in Mark. We see a young woman who gives the Lord her best 
And what are some biblical principles that we can draw from as a church from this passage of Scripture? The first thing is this. I want us to know that our best work is extremely costly. Are you hearing that, First Baptist Edmund? As we talk about moving forward into the future, I don't think that there's a, there's a person in this church today who says to the Lord, Lord, we want to give you our, what's good. We want to give you a half-hearted, a half-hearted service. I believe that every person in here, you say, Lord, I want to give you my best. We as a church, Lord, we want to give you our best. Well, let me let you know. Let me, let, let me share this with you. Our best is costly. It's going to cost us something. We see that in this passage of Scripture. And by the way, Mark is contrasting the, the hatred of the religious people in, in, in verses 1 through 2. He's contrasting that to the love of the woman in verse 3. Mark doesn't tell us who this is, but it's one of the Marys, uh, as we can look at other, uh, the other Gospels and draw that conclusion. But he says there in verse 3, while he was in Bethany, so this is right before the triumphal entry, before Jesus enters Jerusalem. Bethany is on the outskirts of Jerusalem. While he was in Bethany at the house of Simon, who, who had a serious disease and was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of pure and expensive Fragrant oil of nard. This is taken from a plant in India. The oil that makes this perfume is extracted from the roots of a plant in India. And then it is transported, it was transported to where, to where the woman is here in Bethany. We're talking about something that costs a lot of money. We're talking about something that's very expensive. And we know it's expensive because look at what the naysayers say in verse 4. But some were expressing indignation to the others. Why has this fragrant oil been wasted? For this oil might have been sold for more than 300 denarii. More than 300 denarii. Well, we know that one denarii is a, 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 denarii is a day's wage. So 300 would be what? A year's approximately a year's wage. Can you imagine taking your whole income for a year and giving it totally to, to a cause? Taking your income for a year, whatever that may be, and giving it to the cause of Christ. That's what we see here. I mean, that's what, this is what this is equivalent to. She takes this very costly, Mark tells us, she takes this very costly vial of alabaster perfume. And she does what with it? She breaks it and she anoints the head of Christ. So let me say again, our best work is extremely costly. First Baptist Edmund, as we move forward in the future, we must realize this. Halfway doing things is not, is not going to honor the Lord. And I'm going to try to be as gentle as I can without meddling too much. Sitting on our rear ends on a Sunday afternoon watching football while a world dies and goes to hell all around us is not going to get it done. Amen. Well, a few of you agree. Many people have asked me, Pastor, what are we planning on doing with Sunday evenings? Oh, I've been praying about that. Does the Lord want us to have a Sunday evening service? I mean, we come on Sunday morning and, and we're, we are the church, right? Well, but we need to go out. There's times in our life when we need to go out and we need to be the church. Mondays, people are going everywhere. They're at work. They're, they're taking their kids to football games. They're tired. Tuesdays are the same way. So during the week, we're constantly competing, right? We, we, it's hard to visit people at home. It's hard to do any type of ministry project in our community but because everybody's going their separate ways during the week. But not on Sunday. People are at home on Sunday. You're not at work on Sunday. Some of you might be. What about using our Sunday nights to take the gospel into our community? Well, what about you? I'm going to need somebody to talk to me now. I mean, if you, if you don't, if, we're, if you're not on board, then don't say anything. 
Just sit there. But if you're on board, you need, we need to know you're on board. You hear me? What about going in our community on a Sunday night, getting up here at 4 o'clock, organizing ourselves into evangelism groups, going in our community, knocking on doors, and sharing the gospel with people? What about adopting some apartment complexes and going to those apartment complexes and, and not, not turning our nose up at them and saying, well, they don't live like us, they don't look like us. Why don't we go to those apartment complexes and, and adopt that apartment complex and go in there and start Bible studies and take vacation Bible school to those children and have backyard Bible stu studies so that we can begin to impact them with the gospel before they become addicted to drugs, before they begin to be influenced by the ungodliness of this world. We, we can't sit back and say, well, they know where we're at. They know where we're located. No, let's go. Let's get out into the community. Let's go and take the gospel, not only to people's homes, but let's go. Let's go to the apartments. Let's go to our mayor and ask our mayor, what is it that we can do as a church? What are some of the greatest needs in Edmond. What, are, what can we do? We don't want to just sit back and watch things happen. We want to be a part of making a change. We want you to use us. What can we do? Let's go to our school superintendents and let's ask them, what are some of the greatest needs in the school system? What can we do as a church to help our school system? What can we do to help you to be better? What can we do to help your school to be stronger? What can we do to help our city to be better? What can we do to be a light that shines in the midst of the darkness? What what can we do to help families and to help marriages? What can we do to help those who are addicted to drugs, those who are struggling in, in, in life? What can we do? What can we do, God? Because we know it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us, it's going to cost us money. It's going to cost us something. But Lord, I'm in this to win this. Amen. So Lord, take my life and let it be, right? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my life and let it be, Lord. We sing it, don't we? Take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to thee. We sing it, but do we mean it? Amen. We sing, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my greatest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. When I survey the wondrous cross, it demands my soul, my life, my all. And then we leave here and we use our soul, our life, our all the way we want to do it. We sing it, but do we mean it? Amen? Amen. I'm saying that we need to mean it. I'm saying that we need to gird up our loins, we need to bow our necks, and we need to get out into our community, and we need to love people passionately with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's ask God to use us to make a difference. Let's ask God, Lord, we may not be able to change the world, but, but by golly, we're going to go down trying. Amen? Amen. So, it's going to cost us something. Where it's going to cost us. Giving the Lord our best. I mean, you can ask William Carey. Physical illness. You know what ended up happening to William Carey's wife, Dorothy? She went insane. Literally. She lost her mind. They lost a child, their little girl. And she couldn't deal with, with the change in India. She had to be institutionalized. And eventually she died. Oh, the cost is great. Never to return home again. Living in poverty, but being used mightily of God. Ask David Brainerd if giving the Lord your best cost you something. He would tell you yes. And I'm saying to us this morning, church, it's going to cost us something. Giving the Lord our best is going to cost us something. And we need to be willing to give. And by the way, whatever the cost, it's not too much for what the Lord has done for us. He's already given us the example. Christ gave his life. He who knew no sin became sin. Everything points back to the gospel. Why should we give the Lord our best? Because of the gospel. Why should we be, why should we be willing to pay the cost? Because of the gospel. Everything points back to the gospel. The gospel is our motivation. God gave his own son and Christ willingly came and he died in my place and your place and took my sin and your sin and absorbed the full cup of God's wrath there upon Mount Calvary. And now through his shed blood, 
Now through his shed blood, I stand forgiven. I stand cleansed. I stand redeemed. I stand as one adopted into the family of God, a joint heir with Jesus. And I have a hope that is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And it is that truth and that truth alone that motivates me to give the Lord my best. Not just in 2013, but all the days of my life that the Lord allows me to tarry here upon this earth. Are you in or you out? Amen. Amen. Our best work is not only costly, our best work is totally consecrated. Something that is consecrated is set apart. This woman, her best work was consecrated to the Lord. It was totally given to the Lord because what did Mark say? She took the alabaster vial of perfume and what did she do with it? She broke it. You know what that signifies? There's nothing left. She didn't keep back a little for herself, did she? She didn't keep back a little for herself. She broke it. She took the entirety of the vial of expensive perfume and she broke it and she anointed the head of Christ with it. And Jesus told us why she was doing it in preparation for his burial. Here she is worshiping and anointing the head of Jesus because she understands that he is the one who is to die upon the cross for her sin. And we know that truth too, don't we? that Jesus is the one who died upon the cross for our, our, our sin. And the work that we offer him is, is going to be costly. We need, we need to go ahead and ex expect that. But it's also to be totally consecrated. Totally given to him. Not half-heartedly, but totally given. A great example of this is William Carey once again. William Carey spent seven years in India before he ever saw his first convert. Lost a child. His wife went insane. And seven years before he saw his first convert. But he didn't quit. He didn't give up. He didn't throw in the towel. You know why? Because his work and his life was totally consecrated to the Lord. Finances, everything, totally consecrated. His family, totally consecrated to the Lord. As, as William Carey began to labor over the Greek text, first he had, to, he had to learn the language. The Bengali tongue and the Hindi tongue and learning Sanskrit and all those different things. And he studied. And then taking the Greek and translating that into their tongue. And he spent many years translating. Several years into his translation, you know what happened? A fire and destroyed his work. Many of us would say, my wife is gone, my, a child is gone, my work is gone, apparently God is not with me here. I've seen one convert in seven years, I'm going to get back on the ship and I'm going to go to Great Britain, but not, not William Carey. He started over, immediately started over and began to translate. Why? totally consecrated to the Lord. What was it that caused David Brainerd when he, was, when he was vomiting up blood, shivering with fever, what was it that caused him to lean up beside a tree, unable to stand on his own, and to continue to preach the gospel? What was it? It was the gospel message itself. These men were totally consecrated to the cause of Christ because of the gospel. Yes, these men are exceptional, but to a degree they're ordinary. You know why? Because they're just like me and you. Saved by the grace of God, filled with the Spirit of God. But they never got over their salvation like so many of us have. Oh, church, as we move forward, we're going to have to be totally consecrated to the Lord. 
totally consecrated to the Lord. We give ourselves, we give our families, we give this church, we give our finances, we give our budget, we give ourselves wholeheartedly to the cause of Christ. We take everything that God has blessed us with and we use it to leverage the gospel. And we do whatever it takes within the confines of Scripture to get people to Jesus. We've talked about working here in Edmond. And I started with Edmond first. Because if you don't start with Edmond and you start talking about overseas, you always get those people that say, well, they're always talking about going overseas. But what about right here? You know why people say that? It sounds real pious, doesn't it? But the reason they say that is because they don't want to go overseas. <laughs> so it makes them feel better. All this talk about going overseas, and what about right here in Edmond? People right here need the gospel too. Absolutely. But there's something about going overseas that reminds us of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, doesn't it? Go ye therefore into all the nations. The ponte ta ethne is what the Greek says. To all the ethnics. To all the ethnics. Go to all the ethnics. And make disciples. So as we move forward into the future, we're not just talking about Edmund. And we're not just talking about ad ad adopting neighborhoods and adopting schools and, a and adopting apartment complexes and starting Bible studies throughout our community wherever the Lord allows us to do that. I'm not just talking about going to a park and let's grab some, let's grab some paint chippers and some primer and some paint and let's just, let's just roll up our sleeves and let's just do what we can to minister to people, to minister to our community. And sh I've already preached that. I've got to move on past that one, right? But I'm, I'm talking about going to places like Chicago. I don't know about you, but when I, hear, when I hear the news and they talk about it has the highest crime rate and murder rate, you know what? A lot of people will say, oh, man, we probably don't need to go there. That's where I want to go. Amen? That's where I want to go. That's where the gospel is needed. The gospel is needed where the darkness is, is where, where the darkness permeates and where the darkness thrives. That's where we have been called to take the light of the gospel. So listen to me, Ed. We're going. Are you hearing me? We're going. Come heck or high water. We're going. I know our youth already have a mission trip planned. They're going. And we're not just going to do some splash in the plan, pan mission trip. You know what I'm talking about? Where you just show up and you just do something, you come back and you don't go back for another two years. I'm not talking about splash in the pan type of stuff. I'm talking about investing in that city for the long haul, for the long term. I'm talking about investing in the city that D.L. Moody invested in for so many years and saw people converted by the hundreds and by the thousands, but yet the church has turned its back and wickedness and evil is prevailing in that city. And I'm saying to us, those of us here in the south, those of us in the Bible Belt, let's not only reach Edmond, let's reach Chicago. Amen? I'm in. If you're in, I'm in. Let's, let's, I'm in whether or not you're in or not. But here we go. We're going to go. But now listen. What about New York? What about major cities like New York? New York? Do you realize that the, the nations are coming to these large cities? Over 250 different di uh, languages spoken just in, in, in Chicago alone. There's more people in the city of Chicago than the whole state of Oklahoma. And they're lost. Many of them are lost. And the churches there need help. And we have the gospel and we have the means. The question is, is do we have the want to? And we can talk about New York and investing there. I know this church has already been investing in New York, but you know what? We need to continue to invest. We need to continue to, to pray and, and ask how God would use us there to plant churches and to help plant church planters and help finance church planters. And then we need to talk about places like Brazil. And we need to talk about places like India. And we need to ask how God would use us there, places like Africa. And by the way, the testimony of William Carey goes on and on. Do you know who eventually went to Africa as the first missionary? The first white missionary? David Livingston. And do you know who David Livingston was influenced by? William Carey. So you have David Brainerd, who was winning Indians to Jesus, Native American Indians. And then David Brainerd influenced William Carey. And William Carey went to India and won and won millions to Jesus there in India. 
And then David Livingston, influenced by Kerry, went to Africa. And God used him to help abolish the slave trade and to take the gospel to the people there and millions there in Africa coming to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Do you see the ripples of glory that take place when God's people commit to doing their best and to give him their best. The ripples go on and on and on and on and into eternity. And this side of glory, the Lord may not ever show us what he's doing because we'll get the big head. But one day in glory, the Lord will show us the efforts of our labor. One day in glory, the Lord will show us the souls that have been saved, the lives that have been changed, the way the gospel has impacted the world world by a few faithful people in Edmond, Oklahoma if we're committed to give the Lord our best. Amen. Well, I'm thinking that my new <clears throat> we had a business meeting coming up in a few weeks. I'm going to make a motion that we let me preach for two hours. Okay? <laughs> so it's extremely costly it's totally consecrated. Now listen to this one. It's often criticized. Oh, when you, some of, well, there may be some of y'all criticizing right now. Just nailed you, didn't we? Criticizing. That's what we see here. She takes this vial of perfume and she anoints the head with it. And, what, and look at the Bible. Look here. Look, you got to see this. Look at this. Verse 4. But some. There's always some. Remember, the some do not represent the multitude. Now, they think they do. They'll come to you and they'll say, well, pastor, I just want you to know that everybody's been coming to me and telling me. Really? Everybody's been coming to you and telling you? Could you give me their names? No, no. Because really, there's not everybody. It's always some who think they represent the everybody. Right? Some. Some were expressing indignation to one another. Why? Are you kidding me? Why is this fragrant, expensive perfume being, and what did they say? Wasted. Make no mistake about it, First Baptist Edmund, when we, when we attempt to give the Lord our best work, it will be criticized. And often that criticism comes from people in the church. Oh, we can expect that. That's part of the process. There'll be criticism. There'll be threats. As we saw last Sunday. Right? There'll be more of that kind of stuff. We need to expect it. If we expect it and realize that it's part of the process, it doesn't bother us. We just realize, well, we knew that was coming. Glad that one's over with. We'll get ready for the next one, right? Our best. It will be criticized. But my last point this morning is, let me make sure you got it. Our best work is costly. Our best work is consecrated, totally given to the Lord. It will be criticized. But number four, it's always commended by the Lord. It may be criticized by some, but it will always be commended by the Lord. And who are we in this to please? That's right. We're in this to please the Lord. I decided a long time ago as a pastor that when the Lord called me into the ministry, I, I received some great advice from some older pastors. And they said, Brother Blake, you need to realize right now that you're only, the only person you're calls, called to please is God. And as long as you're seeking to please the Lord, you'll be okay. Because you'll never be able to please everyone so it's commended. Look at what they, they argue. They say it's wasted. But look at what Jesus says. Leave her alone. Amen. Jesus defends her. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing. She has done a noble thing. Oh, Jesus calls it noble. Jesus calls it beautiful. He says you always have the poor with you. And you can do for them whenever you want. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She's done best. She has done what she could, and it was good. She has done, I'm sorry, it was excellent. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. 
I assure you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. Do you see it? Oh, they criticized, but Jesus commended. They said it was wasted, but Jesus said what? It's noble. What do you think the Lord thought about the work of William Carey? I can tell you what some people thought about it. As a young man, when William Carey was invited to one of the Baptist meetings, William Carey stood up and said, we need to take the gospel to the nations. And one of the elder pastors by the name of John Ryland Sr., John Ryland stood up and he said, sit down, young man. If God so desires to save the heathen, he'll do so without you and without me. And they all criticized Kerry as being a fanatic. But Kerry's passion and Kerry's work is a sweet-smelling aroma in the nostrils of God. He did not listen to the criticism and the Lord commended him. And blessed him with fruit that is still being reaped today. Long after William Carey has departed from this life. Criticism. Brainerd faced criticism. Brainerd faced much criticism. People trying to tell him, you're sick. Quit doing what you're doing. When the rest of the world were trying to kill the Indians. <laughs> Brainerd was trying to evangelize the Indians. When everybody else was looking at the Indians as savages, Brainerd looked at them as lost souls in desperate need of the gospel. And he didn't listen to the criticism, but he continued to preach and to labor for the cause of Christ, and Jesus commended him. And we see the same thing here with the young lady who took the best of what she had and totally gave it to the Lord. And it was a beautiful thing. Do you see, First Baptist Edmund, <clears throat> if we give the Lord our best, not what's good, but what's best, we got to pray about what that is, right? But when we give Him our best, it's beautiful to him. William Carey was buried there in India. He died in 1834. These simple words were inscribed on his tombstone. Are you listening? These are the words on his tombstone. A wretched, poor, helpless worm. On thy kind arms I fall. Oh, that God would raise up in our midst. Oh, that God would raise up among this multitude an army of wretched, poor worms who are willing to fall wholeheartedly upon the arms of Christ. And if we consecrate ourselves to him that way, <clears throat> he will use us mightily for his glory. Let's pray. As we begin to pray, I just... As everyone is bowed, with your head bowed, <clears throat> just hear me now. Please understand that I've been preaching to the church this morning. But I want to say to those of you here this morning who are not saved, those of you who have never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to say to you right now that you need to be saved. You can't work for your salvation. You can't be good enough for your salvation. You must see yourself as someone who is in desperate need of the grace of Almighty God. 
The only hope that you have of forgiveness, the only hope that you have of eternal life is to fall wholeheartedly upon Christ. Without Christ, you are doomed. Without Christ, you are under the wrath of God. Without Christ, you are destined to spend an eternity in hell. Without Christ, you have no hope and your life has no meaning. But in Christ, we have everything. In Christ, we have forgiveness and righteousness and hope. And in Christ, we have peace and joy. In Christ, we have the forgiveness of sin. But you must acknowledge your sin. You must repent of your sin. You must surrender your life to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. For Jesus came and he died upon the cross according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again from the dead according to the scripture. And if you will confess with your mouth that he is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here in just a minute, I'm going to ask those of you who need to be saved to come. There'll be pastors standing down front, even now as the pastors make their way forward. Would you come? During this invitation, if you're on the back row in the balcony, if you're down here on the floor, bring someone with you if, you need, if need be. But come and receive Christ. Come and be saved. Come and surrender your life to Him this morning. Jesus Christ is the only way unto salvation. Come and give your life to Him. I say to the church, would you be so bold as to come and pray this morning? As humble to say, Lord, help me. Help me in 2013 to give you my best. Help me to give you my best. Help me to go wherever you tell me to go. Help me to do whatever you tell me to do. Lord, help me to get rid of whatever you tell me to get rid of. Lord, help me to give you my best as a man, as a woman, as a teenager, as a college student, as a grandparent, as a mother, as a father, as a husband, as a wife, as a single person. Lord, help me to give you my best. Help me to give you my best in my finances, in my thinking, in my tongue, in my words and in my deed. Lord, help me to give you my best. Lord, would you come and pray and ask the Lord to give you the grace of God that will enable you to give him your best. Heavenly Father, pour your spirit out, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and come as the Lord leads?